about aging outrageously and courageously. And you can see that I'm an outrageous older woman from my t-shirt, <laughs> which says outrageous older woman. And I use the word outrageous in a somewhat different way than you may. It does mean being flamboyant. You have to be that way to wear a purple t-shirt in size 3X. When it first came out, I wore it in black, thinking it would make me look thinner. But it didn't work, so I'm wearing the purple. <laughs> but I also divide outrageous into three syllables. Out, rage, us. Coming out of rage. A lot of older people are in rage. They're enraged because of the, some of the decrements of aging. We have arthritis, we don't hear as well, we don't see as well, and there are other things that make us angry. And hopefully we can get the kind of help we need. The re there's some nice chairs over here. The resources we need so that people will come out of rage. And I'm a walking advertisement for aging. You can see the buttons on my blouse. And since you can't read them from the back of the room, I'm going to read them for you. This one says, I'm a good old thing. <laughs> and I am. I'm 76. And I'll be 77 November 15th, and I expect cards. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I wouldn't do that to my mailman. He has enough to carry around. This button says, they're not hot flashes. They're power surges. <laughs> and this one says, successful aging. And this says, enjoy your age. You might as well enjoy it because the alternative is not good. This one says, I'm in the prime of my life. And this one says, youth is a gift of nature. Aging is a work of art. You never saw a baby that wasn't beautiful, at least to its family. And as we get older, we have to work on ourselves. I don't mean that we need to wear 10 inches of makeup. But I mean we have to try to be interesting. Uh, each of us by the age of 65 has five chronic illnesses, but nobody wants to hear about them. We have to talk about other things. This button says, better over the hill than under it. <laughs> this one says, I have potential. A lot of ageist people think old people are over the hill and there's nothing they can do and that's not true. We have potential to have a good life as we age. Sometimes we need help like moving into a place like this instead of dealing with all the tasks of a big house or maybe living alone. This one says, Outrageous Ladies Lodge. The men get nervous when they see this button because the lodges belong to them, the masons and the elks and the lions and all the animal lodges. But in the older age groups, women predominate. Unfortunately, men die on the average eight years sooner than women. So, and women uh, tend to marry men about four years older than themselves so that the world of the very old tends to be mostly women, although I'm delighted we have three handsome gentlemen here today. <laughs> uh, but women, when they grow old, how many of you were moms, had children? Okay, well when you get older, you turn the mom upside down, and you become wow. <laughs> if you look at mom upside down, that's what it says. Wise old women, witty old women, Wicked old women. <laughs> Wild old women. Uh, this one, there's a little one here that says, older is bolder. We can speak our minds when we get old. What are they going to do to us? Fire us? No, we're already retired. <laughs> this one says, rasp. 
RAPS sp stands for Remarkable Aging Smart People, which all of us in this room <coughs> are. Or it can mean ravishing, aging, sexy people. Or in view of the state of the society, radical, aging, stressed people. <laughs> RASP is a great organization, and I invite you all to join. You don't have to buy a button. In fact, I don't have any to give you. But hanging around your apartment or your home, you may have a button of a politician you wish you hadn't voted for. Maybe the one who could, couldn't keep it zipped. <laughs> and you can put masking tape over that politician's face and write R-A-S-P on it. And if you become a RASP, that means you have to RASP to make things better for yourself and better in the world. And uh, I will never ask you to come to a meeting or send you a newsletter or ask you for dues or to be in a committee. So you can safely be a RASP. And this button on my hat says, Aging to Perfection. Uh, we are the first generation to live as long as we do. Many of us lived much longer than our parents or our grandparents. And we, have, we live a long time as old people. I couldn't get all the buttons on my chest, <laughs> big as it is. So I bought a few more in a bag. This one says, come laugh with me. This one says, I'm here to tell the story. You need to listen to old people's stories. One of the things I do, I live in Wellesley, Massachusetts, is I teach memoir writing courses at senior centers, at buildings like this, and other places, because old people have wonderful stories to tell. Some of them were the children of immigrants to this country, people who came from Canada, from Europe, from other continents. And they can tell the old family stories. And sometimes if people are older and can no longer write, you can get somebody like this wonderful woman and pay them to video the stories of old people in your lives. Or you can have them dictate into a machine, uh, a uh, tape recorder. This one says, wit and wisdom. All people may not be able to remember a series of meaningless numbers as well as younger people, but they have lived a lifetime and they have a lot of wisdom. This is the one that proves that if you turn mom upside down it says wow. <laughs> this one says, getting better with age. Isn't it interesting in this society, we love antiques, and New Hampshire is famous for its antiques. We love old wine and old cheese, but some people don't like old people. There's ages and prejudice in this, our society against the old, and also against teenagers, I'm afraid. One of the things we have to do as we age is make good choices, and I'll be talking more about that later. And this button says, I'm creating, I'm creating tomorrow's choices. We have to make decisions, and some of you who are in this room are thinking about moving here, perhaps, or your parents moving here, and that's a decision you have to make. And this button says, how dare you presume I'd rather be young. <laughs> uh, we who are old have lived our lives, and we don't begrudge young people theirs. This button says 100. One in every girl babies being born, one in every three girl babies being born now will live to be 100. There are anybody in this room 100 or near it? There's a lot of folks around that are in their hundreds, centenarians we call them. This button says, I'm not a girl. I'm an interesting and courageous old woman. There's nothing to be ashamed of, of being an old woman. In fact, sometimes when I'm not wearing this costume, people will come and call me young woman. And my men friends say, they will say to them, 
young man. And I say in answer, and I'm reading from my book, which is called, one of my books is called Be an Outrageous Older Woman. It was published a couple of years ago by Hopper Collins. And I'm reading this. Don't call me a young woman. It's not a compliment or courtesy, but rather a grating discourtesy. Being old is a hard-won achievement, not something to be brushed aside, treated as infirmity or ugliness, or apologized away by young woman. I'm an old woman, a long liver. I'm proud of it. I revel in it. I wear my gray hair and wrinkles as badges of triumphant survival, and I intend to grow even older. <laughs> so there. <laughs> This button says, I'm not over the hill, I'm on a roll. <laughs> this one says, I've stopped lying about my age. <laughs> There's so much ageism in the society that people lie and say they're younger than they are. They deny their aging, and that's really not healthy because it means that we think people our age are falling apart and that to say that we're with it, we have to think that we're younger. And there are some people who, for instance, won't use senior services even though they need them because they say, that's for the old people. You know, I know an 85-year-old woman who's very lonely, living alone, and she won't go to the senior center because she says, that's for the old people, and she's 85. <laughs> This button says, who says I'm too old? This one says, superstition number 36, life begins at 40. <laughs> well, life begins at any age. It's for all of us, no matter what our age is. And what we should think about is the best age is the age you are now. I have another button that says, life. And that stands for life is for everyone at any age, and we deserve the best we can get. And this one says, I earned every gray hair. <laughs> and I think gray hair is beautiful because it's a halo around our faces. I want to show you some hats. And the reason I'm going to show you the hats is because Hats, to me, are a metaphor. When I say to you, you have to change when you age. You can't be the same. You have to do new things, take on new roles, sometimes be the helped person instead of the person who helps. And I want you to remember that we have to change our hats as we age. So I brought some hats to show you. And some of the hats are antique hats. <laughs> Do you remember this kind of hat that the women wore with all these feathers? And there are birds now that are extinct <laughs> because they killed them for their feathers. And I got this. Um, I was driving up with my friend Charlotte Templin, who's sitting in the back. Charlotte is from Indiana. She's a professor at the University of Indiana. And Charlotte, uh, I made Charlotte stop with me at a garage seat. <laughs> That's where I find most of my hats. There weren't any hats at that particular one. Uh, this was the first hat I got, the old one, that started me collecting. And I had to have this. <laughs> Some of your mothers and grandmothers wore hats like this, remember? And. Uh, it was in good shape when I bought it. The box it was in was crumbling from old age, but the hat was terrific. And all I could, th it's now all bent out of shape because I carry them around in this garbage bag. <laughs> but the woman who had it probably never wore it. She was saving it for best. Right. <laughs> hey, at our ages, let's not save stuff for best. <laughs> Let's use it. Let's use our money. Uh, 
Remember when we wore hats like this to church? <laughs> and they had veils on them? When I bought this one in a garage sale, the veil was all ratty, so I had to take it off. But it uh, brings us back to a different era. And remember when women couldn't wear pants? Oh, you remember. And let's see, here's another old one. Remember when we wore hats like this? <laughs> and then when we went to weddings, oh, oh. we had to wear hats like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a genuine antique. It was a great find. It's called a woman's tea hat. And in our Mother's Day and Grandmother, if they were middle or upper class, what they had to do when they got old was go to tea parties and wear a hat like this, remember? And uh, uncomfortable. But that's what they wore, and it's called a woman's tea hat, T-E-A hat. We don't do that anymore. Now those are my old hats, and to go with them, oh, there's one more old hat. This was from the Jackie Kennedy era. You remember this? I remember. Remember Bill's old And we also had to wear gloves. Because now we're still wearing gloves and mittens in the winter to keep warm, especially here in New Hampshire. But in the old days, ladies had to wear hats and gloves. And this is an old, old pair of gloves that somebody found for me. Hello, folks. And here's another one, if I can find them. Well, I'll come across them later. Now I want to show you some new hats. This is my New Hampshire hat. <laughs> have any of you bought anything from the Guild of New Hampshire artists? They have a place in Concord, and one on Winnipesaukee. And this is my favorite hat, not only because it comes from New Hampshire, which I love, but also because it is made of patches. Can you see all the patches on this hat? Many different patches. Well, that's the way our lives are. First, we were little babies, and then we were little boys or little girls, and then we were teenagers, and we were better teenagers than the teenagers now. And then we were uh, young adults. We maybe got married, maybe we didn't. Maybe we had children, we had jobs. And then we got to be old. Well, when we get to be old, everything we ever were is still within us. But we have to arrange it in a new way. And we have to add new patches, new ways of being as we age. This is a hat that I bought in Massachusetts at the row, near the Rowe Conference Center, where I teach a workshop on memoir writing this fall. I go up there every year to teach. And near there is a craft barn. And I, when I walked in wearing this t-shirt, they marked this hat down. Because they knew nobody else would be crazy enough to buy it. It's pretty wild, isn't it? And it's my picture in this hat was in the newspaper. Some of you came because of the newspaper article. It's also in the cover of my book, Be an Outrageous Older Woman. If any of you are into buying books, I brought a few for you to look at afterwards if you want to. This is also one of my favorite hats. I teach up in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. I'll be teaching up there the last uh, week in June, two courses, one in writing poetry and one in women and aging. And there's a wonderful gift shop there where I bought this hat. And the reason I love this hat is it has stars on it. Can you see all the stones? You look like a chef. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not a chef. I'm a terrible cook. But I like this hat because it has stars on it. And when we get old, we have to be the stars in our own lives. You people in this room who are now old like me, you took care of your families. You took care of your bosses. You worked in your churches or temples. You worked in the community. You did all those things. And now when you get old, you have to be the stars in your life. You have to take care of yourselves and have other people 
help you. You are now the stars. Last week I spoke at Cape Cod at a conference of people who run elderly housing uh, and other kinds of housing, group housing, and they call themselves New England a resident service coordinators. And one of the women made me this hat. Isn't it great? It's got a little butterfly on it. And we have to try to be light like the butterflies. Uh, and you move into a place like this, you have to live lighter. You have to get rid of all that junk that you were falling over, <laughs> all that stuff that had to be dusted, all, you know, the accumulations. As we age, we have to learn to live like this. People are always asking me, do I know the poem, when I am an old woman, I will wear purple, with a red hat that doesn't match. Has anybody ever heard that poem? Yeah. You have? Yeah. You have? Yeah. Well, no, I didn't write that poem, but I suggested that Sandra Motz, who's a publisher, do that book. And I sent her a couple of my poems about aging, and she made a million bucks on the book. <laughs> and if I'd had a brain in my head, I would have done the book myself. I had eight books published, nine actually, but I haven't made a million bucks on any of them. But what Sandra gave me was this little doll. The little doll is wearing a purple dress and a red hat that doesn't match. Uh, and so she got the million, I got the doll. <laughs> I think it's very important when we age to pay attention to our spirituality. It's very good at any age, but I think it's important in our old age. And I'm a Quaker, a member of the Society of Friends. Are there any Quakers in the room? There's not a whole lot of us around. It's a small group, Protestant group. And this is my Quaker hat. It says Quaker on it. <laughs> Actually, this hat was made by Quaker Oats Company <laughs> to advertise Quaker Oats. <laughs> and they gave it out at a conference of people who worked for Quaker Oats, but I found it at a garage sale. <laughs> so there. Uh, this hat says Senior College. In New Hampshire, in many other states, elders are going back to college. There's a woman of age 84 who was studying at UMass Boston for her PhD. And she's 84 now, and it'll take her about five years to get it. And people ask her what she's going to do when she gets it. <laughs> and she says, you'll see. <laughs> people are wonderful. Uh, there are, you could, uh, you live a little far from Durham to go to the University of New Hampshire. But a lot of times there are colleges around. There's some Catholic colleges up the road here in New Hampshire where people can take courses free or for practically nothing as they grow old. Or you can have education uh, by reading and by groups. And here is an educational program that's being offered right here at this facility. So it's never too late to learn. There's one more antique hat I forgot to show you. <laughs> Another bird is extinct because of this. Uh, St. Johnsbury, where I teach, is 40 miles from Canada. And I went to a garage sale in Canada, and an old woman sold me this hat she had forever, which killed off some birds. And it has uh, the price tag still on it. I paid the great sum of $4.75. If you don't believe me, come and look at it, <laughs> this hat. And this hat has a Beanie Baby lobster on it. <laughs> Do any of you have grandchildren? <laughs> Remember we gave Beanie Baby things? I spoke in Portland, Maine last summer, and they gave me this Beanie Baby lobster, <laughs> and I put it on this hat. And this is a sports hat. And the message of this hat is you have to exercise. Even if you're walking with a walker, you need to walk. Even if you're sitting and you, if you're using a wheelchair, you can exercise. I had a brain tumor four years ago, and I was on, attached to an IV me, machine 
for four months because I had blood clots. And there was a medicine called heparin, which you take to dissolve the blood clots. It also kind of dissolves your bones, so I got osteoporosis from it. But anyway, the day that I got off the IV, I got into exercising. And I did, I was taught some exercises I could do sitting down in a chair, and then some that I could do holding on to my walker. And no matter how limited you are, you can move your arms, you can do things, you need to get some exercise. Your body does more than carry your head around. <laughs> And I'm sure here in this facility they help people to get some exercise. Uh, the men were like this. This is a hat from Kentucky, from the horse racing. There's a beautiful uh, park. I love those gorgeous horses they have in Kentucky. And I was down there speaking last year and I got this hat. And this hat, oh, here's the little white gloves that were in the bottom of my bag. Remember when we wore these white gloves? When we went to dances when we were girls, we were not supposed to let the guys touch any part of us in our hands. And we had to wear these gloves. And this hat, my final hat, which I got in a flea market, says, Celebrate Aging. Okay, those are my hats. Now, you can't come and hear a professor without, Carolyn, would you pass these out, sure. without getting some homework. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, Carolyn, uh, a wonderful person who works here, is going to give one of you each, and it will help you as I go over this to... Um, <coughs> To be, have this in front of you. The first thing says, we can choose to accept our aging, despite the ageism in the society and the ageism we have internalized. We have to come to grips with, this is our time of life. Secondly, and I spoke about that earlier, we can choose to acknowledge our rage and express it constructively because mad turned inward is sad. If you're sad and angry about something and you hold it in, you can get depressed. You need to talk to somebody, get it off your chest, and see if something can be done to correct the situation which is making you angry. Turns out, probably nobody in this room, but it turns out a lot of older people find that their mid middle age sons and daughters are not totally hangry, ha happy. And instead of blaming themselves, which is painful, or blaming the society, which is kind of up in the air, abstract, they blame the universal scapegoats. Who are the universal scapegoats? Us, the mothers, right? <laughs> Turns out, in all the things I've written, the most popular piece is why older mothers can't win. <laughs> you want to hear it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I, um, I prefer to call our adult children descendants. <laughs> because if we call them children, it implies we have a vote in their lives. And once they've grown up, we don't. Why older mothers have a tough time? If we are concerned, we are overprotective. If we are unconcerned, we are neglectful. If we nurture generously, we are smothering. If we nurture less, we are withholding. If we are successful, we are intimidating. If we are unsuccessful, we are poor role models. If we are available, we encourage dependency. If we are busy ourselves, we are detached. If we offer advice, we are controlling. If we refrain, 
we are disinterested. If we phone, write, or visit often, we are pests. If we don't, we are thought uncaring. If we give or loan money, we engender resentment. If we don't give or loan money, we are cheap. If we help with their tasks, we are drudges. If we don't, we are considered lazy. If we love husbands or others best, we put them first. If we love descendants first, we have no life of our own. If we put ourselves last, we have no self-love. If we put ourselves first, we are narcissistic. If we hide our needs, we are modest. If we reveal our needs, we are demanding. If we provide for our old age, we are selfish. If we don't provide, we are burdens. If we pitch in, we question their competency. If we don't pitch in, they question our competency. If all or some of this is true, we might as well do what we wish and do it outrageously. <laughs> Point number three says, we can caretake ourselves. We need to do that as we age. We need to eat right, we need to get enough sleep, we need to see our doctors and make sure we have doctors who will listen to us and answer our questions. And if we can't hear so well or remember so well, we need to take somebody with us when we go to see the doctor. And we need to make sure that we tell the doctor all the medications we got from some other doctor. You know, there are people who are taking three medications that are all the same because they have different names and they got them from three different doctors. So we really have to take care of ourselves as we age and get people to help us if we need help. Number four. We can choose to grieve our losses. How many in this room have lost someone dear? A husband, a wife, a child, a sibling, a sister, a brother, a friend? Practically all of us. The longer you live, the more <coughs> losses you have. But you know, the Jews have a very nice custom. It seems a little weird, but they take a little food to the cemetery. I don't mean they have a picnic or a barbecue. I mean when they bury someone, just as a symbol, they have a little tiny bit of food. And what that is saying is the living have to eat. The dead people would not want us to jump in the grave with them. We have to go on. We have to take care of ourselves. Of course we mourn. And sometimes we need help with our mourning. We have to see a pastor or a priest, or a rabbi, or a psychologist, or a counselor of some sort. We have to mourn, but then we have to go on and we have to make a life, and we have to make relationships. We lose people, people move away, people die, we move. Uh, when people move into a facility like this, they have to make new friends. And it's good that there is an opportunity because we need people in our lives. You know, uh, Charlotte, who's sitting in the back that I introduced before, and I were both invited back in 19, what year was it? I think it was 92. 92 to Mount Holyoke to be uh, what they call visiting scholars. Charlotte didn't know anybody there. I didn't know anybody there. And her office was across the hall from me. And so um, we had to either develop a friendship or be lonely. And I wrote a poem about how our friendship developed. Can I read it to you? It's called Fall Harvest. Charlotte, three times we have exchanged peers. In return for my apple, 
chocolate pear, splotched brown, joy aesthetically. I look at this beauty, ripening, like friendship. I speak at a lot of places where older people move in, and at first they're a little hesitant, but it's really interesting how they make friends and how they take care of each other. I was at a place in Boston a few weeks ago, and there was a woman who uses a wheelchair. And rather than stay alone in her apartment, she spends most of the day in the lobby. And she really is a big helper because she greets people. And there was a pay phone in the lobby. It wasn't as nice a place as this. I think you probably all have phones in your apartments, don't you? Or your rooms. Well, there they didn't, and there was a pay phone. And this woman had a lot of silver change. So people would come down to use the pay phone and they would run out of change. And she was always ready to change a dollar for people or to loan them money. And when I came in as a stranger who was going to speak there, I didn't know where the room was that I was going to speak. And there wasn't somebody wonderful like Carol in here to um, show me the way as Carolyn did today. In fact, she lugged my stuff in. And this woman wheeled ahead of me and showed me where I was to speak. And also, there was somebody who was sick that she knew about who hadn't been well enough to come down to lunch. And so she was nagging them in the kitchen to be sure and send lunch up to that person. So people do help each other. Uh, they get to be like family, uh, friends. Uh, number, so a good thing to do is to volunteer to be helpful to people. Number five on this sheet says, we can choose to develop new selves when necessary. That's the putting on of new hats that I was talking about. There's a process that we go through and under five, I have listed the process. The first is involuntary loss. If you lost your husband or wife, that's involuntary. Unless, of course, you killed him or her, which is sometimes <laughs> tempting. Uh, secondly, we mourn the old identity. Oh, excuse me. If you make a voluntary change, like moving into this facility or some other, or giving up a house for living with somebody in a condo or whatever. You miss, you mourn. You miss the old closet. You miss all that old junk you were falling over. You miss the neighborhood. But it was a good move and you, you still, number two, whether it was voluntary or involuntary, we do mourn the old life. We miss some of the patches, but we have to rearrange the patches in new ways. Number three, we seek models or mentors for change. And some of you came to hear me speak today because you saw in the newspaper that nice thing about me, or Carolyn told you to come, or whatever, and you came hoping to learn something. We can learn at any age. Uh, number Four, we develop and implement strategies for change. And in a few minutes, I'll give you some strategies. And then we have to see confirmation of our new identity by ourselves and others. And six, we have to resist returning to the old identity. Some of you have a bathrobe that you bought 100 years ago. You washed it so often that it didn't keep you warm last winter got a little tear under the arm, a button missing, and you keep wearing it when you could get a better bathrobe for two bucks in a church rummage sale. But you hang on to this worn out old bathrobe because it's your bathrobe. In the same way, some people hang on to rolls that are no longer useful to them. I don't mean the kind of rolls you eat. I mean behavioral rolls. Uh, the way we behave, ways that aren't useful because they're used to them. And that's understandable. But we have to put on new hats. We have to resist that old bathrobe that no longer keeps us warm. 
And seven, we can gain increased comfort and even joy in the new identity. When I started to live alone after I lost my husband, I thought it was awful because I had never lived alone before. And now time has passed and I found out there are advantages of living alone. How many of you live alone in your apartments or your houses? Okay, let me read you a little piece in from my chapter on outrageous solo living. Benefits of living alone. You can breakfast with famous cheerful people like Katie Couric and Regis and turn them off when they bore you instead of sitting with someone grumpy. And you can eat the last banana without a would you like it or guilt. You can hang your underwear in the bathtub to dry, leaving the door open so you can hear the phone. You can make phone calls whenever you want and in complete privacy. Also, mail incoming and outgoing is completely secret. You can play the TV or the radio in the middle of the night without worry someone will awake or without considerately turning so low you can hardly hear. And you can dance or sing to the radio without someone thinking you nuts or off key. You can sleep gloriously nude uncovered and walk around the house that way and never worry your teeth aren't brushed or your hair is uncombed or buttons open. You can invite visitors only when you want, and the leftovers are all for you. <laughs> you don't have to make your bed daily or pick up your clothes and books. You can type poems or your diary in the middle of the night and know no snoop will be there to read them. And you can scream out foul words freely. <laughs> and if you're a woman, you'll know that the toilet seat will always be down. <laughs> you can put your favorite flowers or spray in every single room without worrying about somebody else's allergies. And nobody will ask what's for dinner except you. <laughs> um, number eight, the indented there says, we repeat this process as new contingencies arrive. We're all living longer. Not all of us, but most of us. Going back to the left-hand margin, number six, we can choose good helpers in our doctors and other professionals. Number seven, we can express our sexuality not in the same way we once did, but we're still interested, we can still think, we can still read, um, and so on. Uh, number eight, uh, we can be creative in the arts and the way we live. Number nine, we can have recreation, and there is recreation provided here, isn't it, Carolyn? Yeah. And recreate ourselves by attention to our spirituality. And ten, with God's help, we can come to terms with our frailty, frailty, disability, and our mortality. On the next page, page two, you have something that says support system, people. And there I have given you a list of the six functions that people play in our lives. Some people think all you need is one best friend, or a spouse, or a particular son or daughter, but that's not true, especially as we age. We need more people in our lives, and depending on just one person is dangerous. Why? You could lose that person. The person could move away, the person could burn out, the person could even predecease you. So you need a lot of people in your life, and not everybody has to be your best friend to whom you tell your secrets. 
It makes you mentally healthy to have one person in whom you can confide, but you need other people. I have one friend that I just play Scrabble with and go to movies with. I would not tell her my secrets because they would have got to Greystone Farm before I did. <laughs> Um, look over this list. <clears throat> Read the six functions that people, friends, relatives, professionals, like the professionals who work here, play in your lives. And list the names of the people. And if you're putting down only one person every time, that's dangerous. And think about how you could make some new friends and get new people in your lives. The bottom, you can assess your support system. When I was writing my book, Be an Outrageous Older Woman, I did a chapter on friendship. That's the chapter out of which I read the poem about Charlotte. And in that, I had about 30 ways of making new friends. Other people are shy, too. If you ask somebody to have coffee with you or eat with you and the person turns you down, you won't die. Uh, that person may have some good reason, uh, something wrong with that person, that person may be busy, whatever. But if you do, the person does say yes, then you have a new friend. And it's important to keep making them at any age. If you'll turn to the next page. <coughs> It says at top, it looks like this. It says at the top, aging can be spelled. And it tells you it can be spelled anxiety, guilt, income loss, negation, or groaning. Or it can be spelled more positively. Activity, growth, income, adequacy, nurturing, gratitude. And the difference is how you fill the suitcase. And I've drawn a suitcase down below where it says retirements down lengthwise. And when I say retirements, I mean retirements from working in the home as well as paid work or working in the community. And these are the things you need. The first one is residence options to move or not to move. I met a woman who had come in here Christmas time, she said, and she was glad she had moved. That's a decision that many of us have to make as we age. Uh, as I was telling Charlotte, I'm thinking of it myself because I can't get anybody to do the lawn, to, you know, take the leaves away. The snow last winter was a nightmare, etc. Uh, then there are other things, so I'll let you read that for yourself. The next page is a piece of homework if you care to do it. And there will be no F's, and you will not get <coughs> graded. And you can do this if you want to, alone or with a group of friends. Most of us live our lives in kind of three categories. Our families, our uh, network that serves as an intimacy group, our work, whether it's work in the home, or work outside, or work in a community, or church, or whatever, and things we do for ourselves. In the upper half of this sheet, write the kinds of things you used to like to do when you were younger in those three categories. And then you may not be able to do them in the same way now. You may need to put new patches on your hat. Down below, ask yourself how you can do the essence of those things in a new way. For instance, I have some friends who what they loved to do for themselves was to read. And now they can't see very well, so it's hard for them to read. But the state of Massachusetts, and I bet it's true in New Hampshire too, uh, provides tape recorders for people who can no, is that true in New Hampshire? It is. Who can no longer read books and you can order free books on tape from the state and get them sent to you. And in fact, they send you an addressed stamped envelope to send the books on tape back when you're through and then you can get a new one. So it's real easy. So 
it isn't the same as reading, but you're listening to these books. Also now, some radio programs have people reading stories on the radio, so you can listen to that. Um, another thing people might have liked to do for their family is they might have liked to read to grandchildren, say, or play with grandchildren. But there are no grandchildren around. They're all grown up and not children anymore. So sometimes those people, even people living in a place like this, will make arrangements through their church or their synagogue or through the Council on Aging in the town to be sort of a foster grandparent to a child who may not have any grandparents around. And visits can be arranged. Do you have any children coming in here? If this school comes in on a weekly basis. Okay, there's a school that comes here on a weekly basis, and sometimes you can make arrangements to spend more time with one of those children. Uh, I know a woman who used to be an accountant, and now she helps. Come in and sit down. I'm looking for someone. She's in here. She is? Yeah. yeah. I'm and the one that needs something like this. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as soon as she gets the handouts, I will. <laughs> and now that um, she helps this Show little boy with homework, with his math. Uh, so you can do this handout if you want to. The next page has a pea pot on it. Have you all got that page? And it says, Women's Pea Pot Lifestyle. And many of us who wore those old-fashioned hats I showed you, who grew up a long time ago, I was born in 1924, were brought up on the seven negative Ps. The first was patriarchy, that only men could do certain things, and that we all had to be very shy and quiet and defer to men. Well, in the world of aging, where we're all women, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, we have to do all those things. Second is patterning. A lot of women my age and even babies today get a pink blanket thrown over them. And then what's the next toy they get? A doll. A doll. And the message of that is that the woman is to take care of everybody in sight. Eat the neck of the chicken and give everybody the good parts. <laughs> and when women get older, a lot of them feel guilty when they can't give anymore. When they have to be the getter instead of the giver because they were taught their only role in life was to do for others. So they find it hard to accept being done for and being helped by their own children and by professionals. And we have to get over that. The third negative P is propriety. A lot of us were brought up to think that we, as women, had to smile a lot. Keep that mad inside that made us sad. Not speak up, and we have to speak up. If I hadn't spoken up to my doctors, I'd probably be dead now. I got the care I needed when I had my brain tumor because I spoke up. Uh, number four, polite. It's fine to be polite. I try to be polite. I hope you're all polite. But if people aren't treating you well, it's not a good idea to be polite because then you're full of rage. You want to be outrageous. Uh, the next negative P is perfectionism. A lot of women are afraid to try new things as they age because we were brought up as little girls never to have any dust around, arrange the table just right, arrange the flowers just right. And when we get old and they suggest we try something new, like an activity, we're afraid to try it because we won't be perfect. Don't be afraid. Try new things. Put on new hats. The next negative P is pretty. A lot of women and men look in the mirror and they get sad because they don't look the way they used to. Because the magazines and the TV is so cruel about presenting older people as looking silly and stupid. I have a friend who lives in a place like this and she has a basket of marbles outside her apartment. And when people ask her why, she says, 
I want to show I haven't lost my marbles. <laughs> and we haven't. But, um, and we haven't lost our looks. They're just different looks. Wrinkles are wisdom signs. Gray hair is a halo. Our body has changed, but there's nobody to say that it isn't working for us. Uh, we need to get over that hang-up that only 20-year-olds are beautiful. The older women in this room are just gorgeous, and I think the TV person should take their pictures <laughs> as well as mine. Um, the uh, last negative P is to be passive, not to make any plans. Remember I showed you a button that says the choices I'm making today are important because they determine your future. We have to be active in planning for ourselves. The next positive P is pride. Uh, and we're moving to the positive P's now. The first one is pride. Pride in all we've done in the past. Many of you have worked in the home, outside of the home, raised families, worked in your communities, uh, helped people, and you need to be proud of that. You did a lot in your life. Uh, next is power. We have more power than we think. We can speak up. Uh, we can get our needs met. The third is possibilities. There are possibilities for new things we can do. The fourth is passion. Passion for the people we love. Passion for life. And sometimes sexual passion. And last is to be proactive. Not to be a stone, a lump, but to do some planning for yourself. <laughs> if you'll turn to page six, and I thank Carolyn for Xeroxing. Would you give Carolyn a hand for Xeroxing these handouts for you? Uh, and uh, Greystone Farm did these. Uh, number six is coping. I won't read that to you because you're all smart people and you can read it for yourself. But that's some of the ways that we cope as we age. And much on this sheet repeats what I have already said. Uh, so read this sheet and maybe it will give you some ideas. The last page, uh, or the next to the last page, page seven, has in the right hand corner an acrostic. An acrostic is a kind of poem where it says aging, mental health, going down. And it tells you the things that you need for your mental health. Activities that satisfy, growth continues, income adequate, no undue stress, good nutrition. Meaning, do they get three meals a day here, Carolyn? Yeah. Three meals a day, yeah. I know women who live alone who are not eating right because it's too much work, it's only for them, they don't bother, that's wrong. Those of you who live in the community that don't get three meals a day, take care of yourself. Some women living alone who would make a wonderful meal for their families, who would, if company came, make a wonderful meal, really live on tea and toast or junk food, and it really is not a good idea. Meaningful interactions, emergency supports, new friendships, transportation available, a good physical checkup, lots of mental stimulation, helping others, exercise faithfully, ask for help when needed, let go of clutter, take time for self, have a religious community. That summarizes some of the things I've been talking to you. And on that page there is a poem, D for Depression. A lot of older people get depressed, and sometimes they and their families and even doctors think that's natural when you're old. It's not natural. Depression is an illness. It's not something to be ashamed of. And depression is curable. There are treatments for depression. And if you are depressed, it may be from a physical reason, like low thyroid, anemia, uh, medication that you're taking, 
which causes depression, and you need to talk to your doctor. Sometimes you need a change in medication or a new medication that's different, and sometimes you need new activities, and sometimes you need changes in your life. Sometimes you need therapy. You need someone to talk to, a social worker, a counselor, and Medicare will pay for those things. The last page has a list of some of my books, and I have some here if you want to look at them. There's one book that I want to close by reading a couple of things from. Charlotte said to me, you're going to read a few things, aren't you, from the ABCs of aging. Did any of you used to read Mother Goose to your kids, <coughs> or Dr. Seuss, in rhyme? Well, I got the idea of, I'm a gerontologist, that's my work, of making advice palatable for people by doing the ABCs of aging. And so there's one or two poems for every letter of the alphabet. And uh, this will eventually be published with pictures, but in the meantime, I'm selling it for six bucks, which is what it cost me to have it made up in these booklets, and I'm going to read you a few pieces. S is for spots. S is for spots of which we get lots. If our hand is unsteady, which mine is since the brain tumor, or our mouth unready, soup, sauces can burst off our spoon. But the worst is tomato-covered pasta. Will that come out, I ask you? <laughs> Thankfully, as we spot more, 2020 vision is out the door. We don't see those messy dots, are blissfully unaware of spots. However, we must check our garments, not to be labeled sloppy by vomits always ready to criticize those older in tones meaner and colder. We can outwit critical folk even if we can't remove with soap little mementos of our meals. In triumph, we kick up our heels by pinning on great slogan buttons <laughs> that hide we were gluttons. We can wear hilarious pins or buttons of a candidate who wins. We can proudly proclaim our pain over political issues and gain favorable attention from words that salute whatever scarce birds or whales in which we invest by putting buttons over dirty vest. Scarfs are also a dashing ploy that may look festive or coy, but are really hiding coffee that won't wash out for me. We aged are clever. Given challenge, we endeavor to surmount. So out dread spot, we say, using strategies we've got. And the last one I'll read for you, and then I'll ask you for questions if you have any or comments. The last one is W. W W is for walk and water. W is for walk. Don't just talk about getting in shape. Throw on a coat or cape. Outdoors is the place to go, even if you start slow. Do five minutes to start. Walking is good for your heart. Add more minutes each day and you'll be on your way. If the weather is bad and you're mad or sad, Go walk in a mall with a friend you call, or walk alone and stare at interesting people there. But don't walk into a shop for a Sunday with hot fudge on top. W is also for water. Remember, you ought to drink eight glasses a day to keep illness away. You've been wonderful. 
I know that the mind can amass only what the ass can stand, <laughs> uh, but do you have any questions or comments? Wonderful, Ruth. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, many of you uh, did not take any refreshments when you came in, but in spite of what I said about eating nutritious things, a cookie will not kill you unless you have diabetes. There are some delicious cookies here, ginger ale, coffee. You had to say that. Yeah, I had to say that. Gary's diabetic. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. We have sugar for candy, right? Okay. Anyway, those of you who can, and you can have coffee, and there may be some uh, sugar-free soda there. Carolyn can check it. Uh, and anybody who would like refreshments, Anybody who would like to talk to me privately, I'd be happy to talk to you. If you want to look at the books, you can. And Carolyn is also prepared to show you around the building if you would like to see more of the building than this nice room. Thank you very much.